Yes, Mr. Cromwell. Uh, good morning, my lords, my lady. In this appeal, I appear for the appellant, um, Mr. Dello, and Mr. Coppell, King's counsel, appears for the respondent, uh, the commissioner, with Mr. Beddenham, who appeared at the hearing in the administrative court. Um, can I start with the papers, which I hope that the court will have? Uh, you should have core and supplemental bundles. Um, there was a late addition to the court to the core bundle yesterday. Thank um, you. Seen that? Which uh, I, I have put on your desk. Yes. Uh, That's here as well. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, the first item is is the uh, the new pages for the very end of the core bundle, which. Uh, consist of the complaint and the Commissioner's first decision on the complaint. In relation to the authorities bundle, then, um, I put on your desk the whole of the directive predecessor to the GDPR, which is to go into tab 8 Thank you. Um, of the authorities bundle, uh, where currently you only have one provision of that directive. And I have also put on your desk two extracts from Benyon, which I will come to in my submissions, um, one of which was referred to by the judge in paragraph 65 of his judgment um, in relation to consolidating or codifying acts, uh, and the other I rely on um, in relation to cross-headings and the cross-heading to section 166, but again, I'll, I'll come on to that. Um, so far as the timetable for submissions is concerned, the parties um, subject to the court have agreed a provisional timetable. Um, the hearing is, is listed for one and a half days, as I understand it, um, and the parties have agreed that I would open until shortly before three o'clock this afternoon um, and begin my reply around about 12.20 tomorrow. Um, Maybe quickly. Well, I mean, clearly we're in... Um very experienced hands of counsel here. Um, our, our view is that um, w whatever time estimate might have been appropriate when there were about nine grounds of appeal, um, essentially this appeal turns on one ground. Um, there is a second ground, but really the gist of it is within the first ground. Um, and we, we would have thought that there was every reason why the matter could be dealt with in within the day. Um, so I appreciate you were prepared with the court's time estimate in mind, um, but uh, I pass on to you what our general feeling is. Um, we've obviously, if not read everything, read pretty much everything, um, and are very alive to, um, to the issues that arise. So could I leave you with that thought? Um, so please don't feel you have to take it into tomorrow on our account. Yes, and, and the other uh, issue related to timetable is uh, on the respondents' notice points. I dealt with them in my skeleton. Yes, I was intending to say something about them in opening, but then but then leave. That seems a very sensible approach. Yeah, that, that, that to the extent that we need to hear from you on those, they they would seem to be reply issues, largely. Well, 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 well Lord, I'd I'd intended to say something about them in opening, but, I, but if, if the court would prefer, I can, I can leave. No, not at all. I'm agreeing with what you said, yeah. namely that you might like to give them a light dusting I, indeed. Um, in your opening, um, but if you need to do any heavy lifting, um, you'll have a chance to do yes. them in reply. So yeah. Thank you. So the appeal is concerned with the duties of the commissioner to monitor and enforce compliance with the rights conferred on data subjects by the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and to do so in particular by ruling upon complaints made to him by data subjects that their GDPR rights have been infringed. As the court will be aware, the GDPR, like the Data Protection Act 1998 before it, controls the processing of personal data and confers various rights upon data subjects to be made aware of which data of theirs is being processed and to seek to ensure that it is processed according to prescribed standards. Uh, 
to rectify or erase inaccurate data and to claim compensation from data controllers for damage caused by breach of their rights. The relevant duties of the Commissioner for the purposes of this appeal are set out in the GDPR, which, as you again will have seen, was an EU regulation uh, which became retained EU law subject to amendments. Um, so was, re, was repatriated, as it were, subject to the amendments made by the regulations you have in tab 7 of the bundle. Um, in many respects, in addition, the relevant duties of the Commissioner are repeated in the Data Protection Act 2018, the domestic statute which makes some important provisions supplementing the GDPR and which implements a separate EU directive on data protection for the purposes of law enforcement and in related fields. Um, can I take you directly to the key provisions of the GDPR and the Act, please? Um, in the authorities bundle at tab 1, page 102, Page 102, you have Article 57, which sets out the tasks of supervisory authorities, as they were referred to in the, in the EU GDPR, once repatriated uh, the Commissioner. And the Commissioner's tasks um, include, at A, to monitor and enforce the application of this regulation, um, and key for our purposes at F, to handle complaints lodged by a data subject and to investigate to the extent appropriate the subject matter of the complaint and inform the complainants of the progress and the outcome of the investigation within a reasonable period. Um, and we know from subsection th three um, paragraph 3 of this article on page 103 that the performance of the Commissioner's tasks is to be free of charge for the data subject. Um, so that's a, that's a task of the Commissioner and if you could then go to page 110 the matter is recast, or the matter of complaints is recast in terms of rights conferred upon data subjects. And Article 77, right to lodge a complaint with a commissioner without prejudice to any other administrative or judicial remedy, every data subject shall have the right to lodge a complaint with a commissioner if the data subject considers that the processing of personal data relating to him or her infringes this regulation. And paragraph two, the commissioner shall inform the complainant on the progress and outcome of the complaint, including the possibility of a judicial remedy pursuant to Article 78. And while we are here, Article 78 confers the right to an effective judicial remedy against the commissioner's decisions, um, both his decisions in relation to complaint and other decisions. Um, without prejudice to any other administrative or non-judicial remedy, each natural or legal person shall have the right to an effective judicial remedy against a legally binding decision of the Commissioner concerning them. And uh, you'll see from my skeleton argument that the concept of a legally binding decision is explained in the recitals to the regulation and includes a decision rejecting or dismissing a complaint. And then 78.2, without prejudice to any other administrative or non-judicial remedy, each data subject shall have the right to an effective judicial remedy where the commissioner does not handle a complaint or does not inform the data subject within three months on the progress or outcome of the complaint lodged pursuant to Article 78. 
27, uh, and that's the right that we'll see in a moment in section 166 of the Data Protection Act. Um, and finally, on the GDPR for the moment, article 79 on page 111, and again the words, without prejudice to any available administrative or non-judicial remedy, including the right to lodge a complaint with the Commissioner pursuant to Article 77, each data subject shall have the right to an effective judicial remedy where he or she considers that his or her rights under this regulation have been infringed as a result of processing in non-compliance with this regulation. And as you see from the heading to Article 79, that is a right to a remedy against the data controller. Again, as we'll see in a moment, that is a right which in this country is exercisable in the county court or the high court. Um, turning then to the key provisions of the Data Protection Act 2018, page 166 of the authorities bundle in tab 6. Section 165, complaints by data subjects, and 165, subsection 1, restates the effect of Articles 57.1f, 57.2, and 77 of the GDPR that we've just looked at. It says those provisions confer rights on data subjects to complain to the Commissioner if the data subject considers that in connection with personal data relating to him or her there is an infringement of the GDPR and various steps that the Commissioner must take in, a, in, a, in 165 for in response to a complaint, uh, again, uh, implementing, restating, reiterating what's in uh, the GDPR. Um, and section 166 on the following page is concerned with orders to progress complaints, and this is what we say is the procedural remedy to go to the first tier tribunal to complain that the commissioner has not, as it says, failed to take appropriate steps to respond to the complaint, failed to provide the complainant with information, um, or failed to conclude the complaint within the initial three-month period or provide further information during a subsequent period of three months. Now, we submit that this case raises an important question of principle, whether, as we say, when a complaint is made to the Commissioner of infringement of GDPR rights, the Commissioner is required to decide whether or not there has been an infringement of the GDPR, to use the words of section 165.1, or whether, as the Commissioner says, it is entirely a matter for his discretion whether or not he proceeds to reach a conclusion as to whether there has been an infringement. Now, we know that the Commissioner very often disposes of complaints of infringement of the GDPR without deciding whether there has been or hasn't been an infringement of the GDPR. Um, the judge, in paragraph four of his judgment, um, recorded uh, guidance issued by the Commissioner. That's at page 49 of the core bundle. You may have it separately. Um, um, guidance given by the ICO which explains what he will do when a GDPR complaint is made to him and among the potential outcomes on page 50 uh, about halfway down the page um, there are a, a number of potential outcomes we can find the organisation that the data controller has acted properly, no further work for us to do, or we can record your complaint without taking further action to 
help us build a picture of how an organisation is complying with the law, um, tell the organisation to do more work, etc. Um, and the final point, we can take regulatory action, but this is only in the most serious cases. Have you taken us already to all of the statutory material that we have to construe? Um, I will be returning to one or two recitals of the GDPR. No, I, I understand that, but, but essentially the matters which you've, you've rightly started with yes. are the key yes. provisions which we have to construe. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the Commissioner is quite open with the public that he may, he may not decide um, whether or not there has been an infringement in their case. He may simply record that complaint uh, and take no further action. It was explained in the witness statement submitted by the Commissioner in these proceedings, uh, Call Bundle 147, pay, uh, paragraph 15, that, and I, we don't need to turn it up, but the Commissioner's witness says that as a regulator, we have to be selective in the complaints we investigate further concentrating on the cases we believe give us the most opportunity to improve the information rights practices of organisations. Now, we don't know how many or what proportion of complaints, of GDPR complaints, do result in a decision by the Commissioner whether or not there has been an infringement of the GDPR. There was no evidence put before the Administrative Court by the Commissioner as to the numbers of complaints received or as to how they are handled uh, overall. The judge um, extracted figures in paragraph 6 of the judgment for total numbers of complaints from an annual <coughs> report published by the Commissioner. Uh, but we don't know, and it, it, it may be that the Commissioner reaches a conclusion on infringement of GDPR rights in only a few complaints each year. Or he may reach a conclusion that there has or hasn't been an infringement in many thousands of complaints this year. We don't know, and it doesn't matter, because the argument is really one of principle. Our primary case, first ground to appeal, is that the Commissioner is required to decide all complaints of infringement by reaching a conclusion as to whether or not there has been a breach of GDPR rights. If the Commissioner construction is correct, he is not obliged to reach a firm conclusion on any complaint. It's entirely a matter for his discretion whether he does or not. Now the issue, this, this issue of principle arose in the present case because the Commissioner did not make what he described as a conclusive determination of the claimant's complaint that the the appellant's complaint that his rights under the GDPR were being breached by uh, TransferWise, now known as WISE, refusing to tell him which personal data of his it was processing. So the GDPR right in issue was the right of subject access in Article 15 of the GDPR. Um, described in a case called Rondon, uh, which you have at tab 20 of the authorities, paragraph 70, page 447, by Mrs. Justice Collins Rice, as the primary and fundamental data subject right. The right to, to be told by a data controller which personal data of yours is being processed. A, a right which is subject to various exemptions, um, which are largely set out in the 2018 Data Protection Act. Now, um, Wise answered the subject access request, see paragraph 91 of the judgment, but withheld a significant amount of documentation containing personal data of the appellant obvious to the appellant at the time and has been borne out by Wise's subsequent disclosures to the appellant. 
and it did not cite at that time any exemptions as the justification for withholding data. Um, we've explained the course of correspondence with the with TransferWise and then with the Commissioner in our skeleton argument, uh, paragraph 6 to 9 and paragraph 25. And you have the final stage of the correspondence with the Commissioner at 186 of the core bundle. And what the Commissioner did, we say, in that final uh, decision was essentially to give certain advice to the appellant as to what TransferWise's obligations were and some explanation as to why TransferWise may have complied with those obligations. But it is common ground between the parties and was a fundamental premise for the judge's reasoning that the Commissioner did not decide whether Wise had complied with the GDPR or not. The Commissioner had not asked any questions of Wise to find out whether it had in fact withheld any personal data of the appellant and if it had on what basis. So he simply hadn't taken the basic steps which were necessary to deciding whether Wise had breached the GDPR in its answer to the subject access request. And he didn't do that because, to use his words in his defence, he was not making a conclusive determination as to whether GDPR rights had been infringed. And again, just a reference, you'll see that in the detailed grounds core bundle, tab 28, page C143. And he wasn't making a conclusive determination because, see his first decision, which we added to the core bundle uh, yesterday, the commissioner uh, did not deem the appellant's case to be a sufficiently important case in light of his regulatory priorities. So the key submission that we made under ground one of the appeal is that the right conferred on the data subject by Article 77 to complain to the Commissioner of infringement of the GDPR entails an obligation on the part of the Commissioner to decide whether or not there has been an infringement. Where is that submission founded in the um, material you've taken to us so far? Well, Lord, I, uh, what, what I intend to do is to make good that submission uh, with reference to eight uh, points, so fairly, fairly. Right, so they will include, because they would have to include, um, the material which you've already taken us to. Yes, right. indeed. So the judge, as you know, uh, held paragraph 143 that the Commissioner was under no obligation to reach a conclusive determination as to whether or not WISE had complied with its data protection obligations. I make my submissions, as I say, under eight headings. The first um, is uh, with reference to the right in Article 77. Um, Article 77, 1. Um, the right conferred upon a data subject to lodge a complaint with the Commissioner. Well, that's the right to lodge a complaint. That's right. And th I mean, th th those are the words that you yes. drew up, drew yes. out. And Previously. Yes, and it's yes. the word right in particular. And we say that given the conferral of a right, it ought logically and naturally to follow that there is an obligation on the Commissioner's part to determine whether a complaint is well founded, whether or not there has been an infringement. The GDPR does not merely confer a power on the Commissioner to decide any complaints which are made. So, yes. 
I'm very sorry to interrupt you. I just no, I'm trying to write down what you said. That the right to complain. You we, used a word. We say ought logically and naturally to imply an obligation to decide the complaint. So, so it's to complain of infringement of GDPR rights. We say that ought logically and naturally to imply an obligation on the commissioner's part to decide whether or not GDPR rights have been infringed. Right. So the GDPR does not merely confer a power to decide any complaints which are made. It confers a right to complain to the commissioner. It confers a, a right upon data subjects to complain to the commissioner in order to enforce their rights. And we say it is critical to any sensible right to complain of infringement that your complaint of infringement will be decided. We say it would be highly unusual, and indeed, as far as our researchers tell us, a unique right to complain to a regulator or other public body which did not require the regulator to decide in any case whether the complaint was well founded. We say that, that, that simply wouldn't be much of a right. And we say that it would need clear language, not present in the UK GDPR, to justify the conclusion that a right to complain does not entail an obligation to decide the gravamen of the complaint. That's my first heading, founded on Article 77. Secondly, second heading, GDPR policy. We submit that this strange and emasculated right to complain for which the commissioner contends would run contrary to key policies which underlay the introduction of the GDPR. Before we, before we go into this, because it's no doubt important, um, you, you you went to the right to complain under Article 77. It, because we don't have a list of your eight headings, although they're no doubt in your, to be found in your skeleton, are you coming back to the material that we have to construe, or are you leaving, leave, leaving that behind? Um, because there are obligations on the commissioner in the material that we yes. that we have to construe, and uh, those might be thought to be more directly related to um, to the point that you're seeking to establish. Are you coming back to those? I am. <coughs> shall I? Shall I? Shall I tell you what my my that would be helpful. You give us a, a bird's eye view of the eight uh, points, uh, and then I, and I then and then we we'll know where we're going. Down, but right. um, just in brief. So. Num number one is the right to complain in, in implies a, a right to determination. Secondly, GDPR policy. Thank you. Thirdly, the Facebook Ireland case. Yes. Fourthly, the right to an effective remedy in Article 78. Fifthly, Article 57.1f, which I think is the Provision my Lord had in mind yep. for his question. Sixthly, Article 79, the right to uh, take action against the data controller. Seventhly, legislative history. And eighth, the issue of resources. That's very helpful. All right. Now I understand. <clears throat> so, um, GDPR policy. Um, the relevant policies are helpfully, we say, summarised in a recent judgment of the Court of Justice in the BE case at tab 22 of the authorities bundle, page 589. Uh, this is a Hungarian case, um, 12th of January 2023, to which the court, th this court, may have regard, um, so far as it considers it to be relevant. Um, 
a case brought against the Hungarian supervisory authority. Um, I'll be coming back to it later for a different reason, but could I ask you to turn to uh, paragraph 42 of BE at 594? Um, where the Court of Justice refers to the objectives pursued by that regulation, the GDPR. Perhaps if I pause, pause there to explain the, broadly the, the facts of the case were that the data subject had complained to the supervisory authority. His complaint had been rejected and he had taken action against the supervisory authority in the Hungarian courts. He had also brought a complaint against the data controller, which had been successful, and he had obtained the material he sought from the data controller. And the issue which arose for the court in the claim against the supervisory authority was what, what to do about the other finding, which had already been made in the action against the data controller. Um, um, whether it was bound by it, what priority should be afforded to it, etc. But so far as GDPR policies are concerned, paragraph 42, the Court of Justice says it is apparent, in particular from recital 10 of the GDPR, that the aim of that regulation is to ensure a high level of protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. Recital 11 states, moreover, the effective protection of such data requires the strengthening of the rights of data subjects. Um, as the Advocate General observed in his opinion, the EU legislature's decision to leave to data subjects the option to exercise the remedies provided for in Article 77.1 and 78.1 of the regulation on the one hand, and Article 79 thereof on the other, concurrently with and independently of each other, is consistent with the objective of that regulation. So pausing there, on the one hand, you've got the, the root of complaint to the supervisory authority, that's 77 and 78. On the other hand, you've got the right of action against the data controller, that's 79. And it is consistent with the objective of strengthening rights, high level of protection, to allow the remedies to be uh, pursued concurrently with and independently of each other. 43. The GDPR requires inter alia the competent authorities of the member states to ensure a high level of protection of the rights uh, guaranteed in Article uh, 16 to FEU and Article 8 of the Charter. Making several remedies available also strengthens the objective set out in Recital 141 of the GDPR of guaranteeing for every data subject who considers that his or her rights under that regulation are infringed the right to an effective judicial remedy in accordance with Article 47 of the Charter. Articles 10 and 11 are at page 590. Um, just if we are wanting to see what they were referring to. Um, yes, so you get that on page 5 of the authorities bundle. Right. Well, we don't need to go elsewhere, it's just when, when, oh, they're, when they're referencing sorry. articles oh, 12, 10 and 11, that that's where they're conveniently found. Right, so high level of protection and concurrent remedies. Uh, concurrent and independent of each other. And we submit that it is readily understandable how strong enforcement and a high degree of protection would be furthered by a conferral of a right on data subjects to complain about infringement of their rights to an expert authority which was required to resolve those complaints free of charge. See Article 47.3. And conversely, we say it would compromise strong enforcement, a high degree of protection, if the right to complain to the supervisory authority did not entail an obligation to decide whether or not GDPR rights had been breached in any case.
third heading is Facebook Ireland, which you have at tab 21 of the authorities bundle. Um, and one sees from the beginning of the head note that the data subject, Mr. Screms, um, had lodged a complaint with the Irish Data Protection Commissioner um, regarding the processing of his data under the GDPR. His complaint was that the personal data which he provided to the Irish subsidiary of uh, Facebook was transferred to the United States parent company for processing where the parent was required by law to make personal data available to certain domestic state defence and security authorities incompatibly with fundamental rights and that the US offered insufficient protection of the data uh, contrary to uh, provisions of the GDPR. And the data subject sought to require the commissioner, the Irish commissioner, to suspend or prohibit future transfers of his personal data, um, which were being carried out pursuant to standard clauses which had been approved by the EU Commission. Um, those are the essential facts. On page 559 of the bundle, Um, and just a, a, a point of fact, the, uh, paragraph 56, um, the Irish Commissioner had published a draft decision uh, summarising the provisional findings um, um, of her um, investigation. So she, she hadn't reached the final view, but had, had published a provisional decision. And then paragraph 57 brought, a, brought an action in the High Court of Ireland to challenge the validity, raise the issue of the validity of one of the EU Commission decisions which had approved the transfer of data to the US. So, so that's how we, the case ended up in the Irish courts. And at 562, at the bottom of the page, the eighth question, um, if a third country data importer is subject to surveil surveillance laws that, in the view of the Data Protection Authority, conflict with um, various provisions, is a Data Protection Authority required to use its enforcement powers under EU law to suspend data flows or is the exercise of those powers limited to exceptional cases only? So the question being referred was 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 one about the whether there was a discretion on the part of the authority to take action against Facebook, um, um, or whether it had an obligation to do so. That's where it, there had been a breach. If it considered that there had been a breach. That's the question, um, the key question for present purposes. And at 569, paragraph 107, in accordance with Article 8 of the Charter, Articles 51 and 57 of the GDPR, the national supervisory authorities are responsible for monitoring compliance with EU rules concerning of natural persons uh, with regard to the processing of personal data. And at the beginning of 108, it follows from those provisions that the supervisory authority's primary responsibility, primary responsibility is to monitor the application of the GDPR and to ensure its enforcement. And we say, of course, you can't ensure 
the enforcement of the GDPR if you don't even decide a complaint that there has been a breach of the GDPR. There may be a, a wholly egregious breach if you don't reach that, that point of decision as a supervisory authority. You are simply not monitoring the application of the GDPR and ensuring its enforcement. Um, 109 refers to Article 571 f that we are concerned with. The court says, in, a, in addition, under 571 f each supervisory authority is required on its territory to handle complaints which, in accordance with Article 77, any data subject is entitled to lodge, where they consider the processing of personal data uh, infringes the regulation and is required to examine the nature of that complaint as necessary, supervisory authority must handle such a complaint with all due diligence. And we say, again, dismissing what we assume to be tens of thousands of complaints each year without reaching a decision on infringement uh, is not handling the complaints with all due diligence. And the phrase is required to examine the nature of that complaint as necessary is a bit oracular, isn't it? Can you just what? What do you say that means? Well, um, each complaint that's made to the commissioner will differ as to how much consideration or investigation is necessary to reach a conclusion as to whether or not there has been an infringement. For some complaints, it will be perfectly obvious that there isn't an infringement. For some, uh, perfectly obvious that there is. And, and, and not very much investigation will be required. But each, each case will differ um, as, to, as to how much the commissioner needs to do um, in order to, to get to the point of reaching a decision. A decision on infringement. But when we want, one, one simply has to <laughs> pose, pose the hypothetical question when the, when the Court of Justice said that complaints must be handled with all due diligence, was it really envisaging that tens of thousands of complaints each year could be dismissed without any decision as to whether there had been an infringement or not? But, but the language of determination or decision making isn't actually used in that passage, is it? Well, the language which is used is handling, handling the complaint, which is the language of Article 57 1F, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back yeah. to that. Um, we say hand, hand, handling a complaint must include deciding it, deciding the allegation of infringement, which is the gravamen of the complaint. It, it, it involves other procedural steps, um, but um, um, it must, uh, as central to a complaints process, involve a decision on whether there has been an infringement or not. Okay. So all due diligence, and then paragraph 111, in order to handle complaints lodged, Article, Article 58.1, confers extensive investigative powers on each supervisory authority. And then if a supervisory authority takes the view following an investigation that a data subject uh, is not afforded an adequate level of protection in the third country, it is required to take appropriate action to remedy any findings of inadequacy, irrespective of the reason for or nature of that inadequacy. Is there any significance in the fact that the court refers to investigative powers rather than investigative duties? Well, I, I believe what it means by investigative powers is is it has um, as as part of the duty to investigate, it, uh, supervisory authorities will have powers to seek information from data controllers, to enter data controllers' premises in some cases. There's a whole 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 
panoply of powers, um, which the which the court relies on to say that <laughs> this is serious. You you have the tools to conclude an investigation uh, in each in each case. But the 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 finding in 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 one hundred and eleven, which which is the is the answer essentially to the eighth question, is the answer to the question is if having investigated the authority takes the view there is an infringement, then it must take action to um, um, uh, to put an end to that infringement. Uh, now, I, um, I accept, of course, that's not not quite the same as whether you have to investigate in the first place. But we say it simply can't be right. If there is no discretion and the supervisory authority must take action to prevent an infringement which it has found, can it really be right that the authority can instead say, well, no, we're just not investigating. We're just not even going to, going to get to the point where we can decide whether we're not going to ask transfer-wise which data it withheld uh, 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 and, and why. Um, so we never get to the point where our duty to take action is engaged. That just can't be right. It would make no sense whatsoever if that, if, if the high degree of protection pursued by the GDPR was to be circumvented in that way. Um, and then paragraph 112, although the, the supervisory authority must determine which action is appropriate and necessary, and take into consideration all the circumstances of the transfer in question, the supervisory authority is nevertheless, nevertheless required to execute its responsibility for ensuring that the GDPR is fully enforced with all due diligence. So not fully enforced in a small number of cases which we think are important enough, as the Commissioner says, but fully enforced. And finally, um, on page hundred, on page five hundred and seventy-nine, paragraph one hundred and fifty-seven. It's in, in, in answer to a to the fourth, fifth, ninth, and tenth questions. Um, but now the court says 157, the fact remains that in accordance with the case law set out above, when a person lodges a complaint with the competent supervisory authority, that authority must examine, must examine with complete independence whether the transfer of personal data at issue complies with the requirements laid down by the GDPR. And if in its view the arguments put forward by the complainant with a view to challenging the validity of an adequacy decision are well founded, bring an action before the national courts in order for them to make a reference to the CJEU. Now, this is, of course, about and phrased in terms of the particular complaint uh, made in the Facebook Ireland case, Facebook transferring data, um, and the Commission's adequacy decision was not sufficient to ensure compliance with data subject rights. But um, strip away the particular facts and the particular complaint, the authority must examine the complaint to see whether the processing, the transfer of personal data at issue, complies with the requirements laid down by the GDPR. So whatever one says about the previous passages, I took you to, and these are concerned with when you've reached a view after investigating, this is squarely, you must investigate to decide whether the complaint is well-founded or not. Now, the, the judge in paragraph 60 I'm sorry, paragraph 50 of the judgment 
uh, dismissed Facebook Ireland as a red herring um, for reasons which we criticise um, in our skeleton argument uh, at paragraph 44. Um, the judge decided that Facebook was a red herring because he said it was uh, concerned with Article uh, 58. I'll just, I'll just take, you to, take, take you to the judgments, if I may, at paragraph 50. Um, paragraph 50 on page 64 of the core bundle. Um, he says, first, this case is not about... This case, as in Mr. Dello's case, is not about the exercise of the extensive investigative powers of the Commissioner under Article 58. Second, the effective judicial remedy provided for in Recital 148 and 58.4 uh, is not the same as the effective judicial remedy provided for in Recital 141 and Article 78.1 and 78.2. Well, we say it is the same. Um, Article 58.4, as it happens, has been deleted from the UK GDPR because it referred to the Charter on Fundamental Rights. Um, we, we've given it to you in the, in the, in the authorities bundle um, um, at, tab, at tab two. Seven. Um, but the, the right to an effective remedy against the supervisory authority is repeated um, in, in Article 78. Um, so whilst Whilst, as I mentioned, I accept that that the the um, the direct answer given by the court in Facebook to the question of the Irish court was concerned with with uh, there being no discretion in terms of taking action when a view has been reached, um, all of the surrounding language and all of the underlying reasoning uh, supports. Uh, the obligation to reach the decision, and far from being a red herring, as we submit in paragraphs 44 and 45 of the skeleton, Facebook Ireland is is directly on on point. Um, fourth heading is the right to an effective remedy, which is the Article 78 right. Um, just to remind you, page 110 of the authorities bundle, right to an effective judicial remedy against the Commissioner. We say that, that our construction of the GDP is supported by the right to an effective remedy against the decision of the Commissioner conferred by Article 78, a right which we say assumes that the Commissioner will decide whether or not there is an infringement of GDPR rights. And we say that a right to an effective remedy against the Commissioner would be emasculated if the Commissioner was really entitled to exercise his broad regulatory discretion not to reach a decision on whether there has been an infringement or not. And why do we say that? Um, Facebook Ireland, again, but in the Advocate General's opinion, um, so on page 494 of the authorities bundle,
paragraphs 145 to 150 on page, page 494. Um, and we rely on the second sentence of or the third sentence of 145. The task of monitoring compliance with the requirements relating to the protection of personal data, also in Article 571A, entails an obligation for the supervisory authority to act in such a way as to ensure the proper application of the GDPR. Thus, 146, examine with all due diligence the complaint. Um, and 147, competent authority is also required to react appropriately to any infringements of the rights of the data subject which it has established following its investigation. So this, 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 these are all points which were upheld by the, by the courts, but, uh, but by the Court of Justice. And 148, although the choice of the most effective means is a matter for the discretion of the competent supervisory authority as in regard to all the circumstances, that authority is required to carry out in full the supervisory task entrusted to it. And then 149, the Advocate General refers, as we put it in our skeleton, in the same breath to Article 58.4, um, effective remedy not in the UK GDPR, but then also Article 78.1 which recognises the right of each person to an effective judicial remedy against the legally binding decision of the supervisory authority concerning them, or where the authority fails to deal with his complaint. And then this, 150, those provisions imply, in essence, um, a, de a decision whereby a supervisory authority refrains from prohibiting or suspending a transfer at the request of a person claiming there is a risk of unlawful processing may be the subject of a judicial action. The recognition of a right to a judicial remedy assumes the existence of a strict and not purely discretionary power on behalf of the supervisory authority. I was puzzled by this. Because it um, presupposes that there can't be a judicial remedy against a discretionary decision, which is not our law. Uh, it may be the law that the Advocate General was referring to. Well, um, I mean, there's, there seems to be a lot of weight put on the word purely. Um, it seems to be a, a, a proposition that. Um, a purely discretionary decision is not amenable to legal challenge. Yes. Well, um, <coughs> that is what is is implied, and we say rightly implied by the Advocate General, as as we'll as we'll come on to in a in a moment. The any any challenge to the decision of a supervisory authority goes to a court or has to go to a court which exercises full jurisdiction over matters of fact and law. Yeah, now, of, of, of course, as, as we know from human rights in case, um, um, judicial review can, can, exercise, can, can, can involve the exercise of full jurisdiction. But what the Advocate General is saying is that, is that um, if, there, if there truly was a broad discretion as to what action to take. It would be difficult uh, difficult to challenge uh, uh, and, and difficult for a court to exercise uh, full jurisdiction over matters of fact and law uh, against, that, against that background. And that is borne out by, this, by our case, where the commissioner says, I have an extremely broad regulatory discretion, which is in effect not, not challengeable. Yes, in theory, there's, there's JR, he says, for some things, but, but it's such a broad discretion um, um, that I can, I can decide not to, to 
to see your complaint to a, to a final conclusion. And I, th th I think it's right, isn't it, that there aren't any decided cases anywhere on the point that you're presenting to us. So um, Facebook Ireland is the closest. Yeah, exactly, but I mean, that's not on this point. Um, I mean, I, I can quite understand why, you, why you're showing us this material for what you say is the light that it casts on this point, but it's not the point that the either the court or the Advocate General was in fact considering. Um, it, was, it was a different point in that case. Um, so... Well, well yes, it, it, was, it was technically a different point, but um, as I've submitted, all of the, the underlying reasoning yeah. applies equally. Yes, but nobody, nobody has taken any other investigatory authority to, um, uh, to a court or tribunal and saying, you, you have to investigate every single complaint because that's what the GDPR requires. Um, this is, in a sense, if you're right, and you may be right, um, you're establishing a new principle um, based upon making explicit what you say is implicit in the legislation and in the such authority as, 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 as can be yes. uh, drawn yes. to hand. Well, my Lord, it, it, it may be, and we would suggest it's, it's perhaps under, understandable that no one else has, has taken a supervisory authority to court because it's an extraordinary position for a supervisory authority to adopt that it has no obligation to decide on infringement in any case. We, we, we would be astonished any, if there was any, any other authority. In any given case? In, well, in, in any case. Um, um, if, if, the, if, if, if the Commissioner's submissions of principle are right, um, he could he could decide in no cases. Yes, that's right. Of course, if, if the Commissioner was to say, uh, we're, we're, we're too busy, um, I'm not going to decide any cases at all, um, then one could quite see where that might lead. Um, but we're, we're talking about the argument as to whether there is an obligation to decide in every case or a discretion to decide in any given case. So, my Lord, I, as I pointed out, the Commissioner hasn't told us how many cases he does actually pursue to a conclusion. It may be that it's only a handful of cases which are deemed sufficiently important. Um, but as you said, it's the point of principle. It's the, it's the point of, of principle, but, but it's not... But that position is not terribly different from I'm deciding no cases because I'm too busy. I'm deciding five cases or ten cases. It's not, not very different. Um, and none of that, applying all of the dicta in Facebook Ireland, none of that represents full enforcement or due diligence uh, uh, and so forth. Um, um, so the right to take the commissioner to court to challenge his decision on a complaint, we say, in in accordance with the, um, the Advocate General's view in 150, assumes that the Commissioner will actually be deciding the issues of infringement. And similarly, um, going to the BE case at paragraph 41, page 594 of tab 22. Um, sorry, I've missed the reference. I'm sorry, 594, 594 of tab 22, paragraph 41. Uh, the court says in BE. That's, uh, the court, that's the court's obligation. Yes, that the court seized of an action against the decision of a supervisory authority should exercise full jurisdiction, which should include jurisdiction to examine all questions of fact and law relevant to the dispute before them. So, so this reads, um, reads recital 143 into Article 78. Point one. And we say, again, this, this assumes that the Commissioner will have made a decision on the substance of the complaint, whether or not there is an infringement. Otherwise, the court will very often be in the position of examining afresh, or, or it's uh, uh, a 
and without the benefit of the findings of an investigation, whether a complaint is well founded. And on the other hand, if the commissioner were really right to say that all, the, all that the courts can decide in a case like my client's case is whether the commissioner had rationally exercised an extremely broad regulatory discretion uh, in order not to make a decision on infringement. Um, we say that would hardly be an effective remedy against the enforcement of the GDPR by the Commission. And, and finally, under this, finally under this head, sorry, I, I think I said Commission. I meant Commissioner. And um, finally, under this head, um, Recital 141, which I don't think we've looked at yet, uh, on page 37. Every data subject should have the right to lodge a complaint with a single supervisory authority and the right to an effective judicial remedy in accordance with the Charter if the data subject considers that his or her rights under this regulation are infringed or where the supervisory authority does <coughs> not act on a complaint, partially or wholly rejects or dismisses a complaint or does not act where such action is necessary to protect the rights of the data subject. So, so this is concerned with the, again, with the, with the right to complain to the commissioner. And then there must be an effective judicial remedy if the data subject considers that his or her rights are infringed. Now that assumes, again, assumes that the commissioner is deciding whether or not there has been an infringement. And if he decides there hasn't been, then there must be an effective remedy for the, for the complainant. And there are other, other circumstances um, in which a remedy must be afforded. Um, and there are, there, are, there are the procedural remedies, does not act on a complaint, partially rejects or dismisses, or does not act where such action is necessary to protect the rights of the data subject. And again, in my client's case, we would say that action was necessary to protect the rights of the data subject. But you, you stopped reading at the point where it becomes more specific. Well, do you mean on the, 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 the investigation? The, the, the following sentence is, is um, part of the picture. Well, well Lord, I'm. So I'm, not, I'm not trying to avoid this wording. I'm, I'm coming on to Article 57 1F in a moment, which, which, which reflects that, that wording. Um, but in but you're, the, in you're, the you're using the, the first half of 141 to, to invite us to draw an implication which seems to be negative by the very next sentence. Well, Lord, with, with, with respect, the next sentence, if, if, one, if, one, if one starts from the Starts with, with my submission that one four one the, the 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 first sentences of one four one plainly provide for an effective remedy where the data subject considers that their rights have been infringed and that hasn't been recognised by the commissioner. The next bit that we're looking at now, the investigation following a complaint, should be carried out subject to judicial review to the extent that is appropriate in the specific case. That doesn't undermine one iota the, the point that, uh, that I was making. All that it says is that, is that the supervisory authority has a discretion as to how much they need to investigate, how much they should investigate, in order to reach a decision. But it would have been simplicity itself at any of these particular points, because there are many landing points for this argument. Um, 
for it to have been said that the investigation following complaint should establish whether there has or has not been a breach of the regulation. Yes, of course. And the reason... And, and it, it, very, it, it very markedly does not say that. Yes, and, and we would say the reason why it, it, it may not say that is because it is blindingly obvious that if you have a right to complain, that your complaint is going to be decided. Right, so that it, it's not a carefully calibrated formulation. Um, it, it, it's a formulation which is based upon a blindingly obvious premises. Well, sorry, Lord, one, I, I started my first heading with, with that premise that a right to complain yeah. must correlate to, to a right to receive a determination of what you're complaining about. But then I, 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 I have supporting reasons for that, GDPR policy, Facebook Ireland, full enforcement, all of those, all of those factors, they're just not reconcilable with a world where the Commission doesn't have to decide any of these cases. I, my my um, puzzle about this is on a slightly different point, which is that there is a, a difference in the language used about the right vis-a-vis -vis the supervisory authority and the right vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary. The right, uh, uh, as against the um, supervisory authority, is a right to lodge a complaint. It doesn't say anything about determination, doesn't say anything about a remedy. The right against the uh, ju judicial, the judicial uh, body is a right to a remedy. It doesn't say anything about lodging a claim. So that there is a difference in language. And, and the question for us is whether that's a meaningful difference that carries with it this conclusion that the judge arrived at, which is that the one is more limited than the other. One is more limited because, of course, the courts will decide the, the case that's brought before them. You don't need to spell out that a court will decide. Um, well, it could have said there's a right, right of access to a court, and then it's blindingly obvious that if you have a right of access to a court, the court is going to decide the question. Um, so it, it, it is a, it's just a puzzle, and we don't have any comparatives um, in other directives, other regulations. Um, we have Facebook Ireland, but that's about it. And, and so we're, we're left with the language. Uh, and... and um, the sorts of points that you're making about policy and uh, context and common sense, it's, it's an unusual kind of issue for this court to have to address, with no precedent uh, on the point. Yes. Well, well I, I, I fully accept there is, there is limited direct precedent, but, what, what, but <coughs> take all the take all the factors, all all the, all the threads, full enforcement, effective remedy. Can it really be right that the commissioner can take tens of thousands of complaints and say, that's noted, we've recorded it, we're not going to decide? Can that be, can that be consistent with full enforcement, <coughs> with a high degree of protection, with concurrent and independent remedies against the supervisory authority? We say, of course it can't. And there really wasn't any need to spell that out. Because, of course, a complaints mechanism means that your complaint, what you're complaining about, will be decided. And, and uh, before I, I leave 141, if the, if the commissioner, if there, if there has to be a remedy a judicial remedy against the commissioner where there's been an infringement of rights that he hasn't recognised, where he's failed to take action which is necessary to protect the rights of the data subject, that must, in our submission, assume that he is deciding one way or the other whether there has been um, an infringement or not, rather than simply it in a filing cabinet and recording that the complaint has been has been made. So, um, fifth heading, Article 57, 1F, and I've, I've, I've said some of what I wanted to say about this already, but it's the <coughs> it's 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 at 102, 
and it's the in the tasks of the commissioner to handle complaints lodged by a data subject and investigate to the extent appropriate the subject matter of the complaint. Now, I submitted under my first heading that the way that the court ought to look at this question is to start from the presumption that a right to complain must, in, must include an obligation to decide the gravamen of the complaint, and it would need clear wording in the regulation to displace that presumption. This is the clear wording which the commissioner and the judge, for his part, relied upon for the conclusion that the commissioner does not need to determine any particular case, any case, as he submitted. So the, the operative words are investigate the subject matter of the complaint. And I think, I th well, I, th I, I, I think the commissioner also relies particularly on to the extent of... Yes, I know, but, 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 but <coughs> leaving that caveat, if it is one, aside, <coughs> the, what, what, what's been chosen as part of the regulation is a duty to investigate the subject matter of the complaint to the extent of it. <coughs> yes, and, and then, yes, and then to, 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 to reach an outcome uh, of which the complainant must be informed. Now, we submit this is not clear wording to displace uh, what one would normally expect to see in a complaints system, and certainly not clear wording sufficient to read down Article 77, where the wording does not appear. What these words mean, we submit, is simply, and I've, I've said it already, the Commissioner has a discretion as to how much investigation is needed, is necessary, before he can reach a conclusion on whether or not there has been an infringement. And that may be very little in some cases, it may be a lot in other cases. Now, what our submission doesn't mean, and you will have seen in my learned friend's skeleton, um, particularly paragraphs 18 and 22, what it doesn't mean is that the commissioner is, is that the commissioner has to investigate absolutely every possible breach, regardless of what the complaint is. That he has to look into every possible exemption uh, on some sort of roving commission, um, any more than any other. Um, regulator or uh, public body with a complaints procedure is required to, to undertake a task of that extent. Um, now, because, because this is wording which doesn't, we say, say or even imply that the commissioner does not need to decide the gravamen of the complaint. And because this wording is not present in Article 77, the judge reasons, and this is um, in particular at paragraph, six, uh, paragraph 70 of his judgment, he reasons from this wording investigate to the extent appropriate the subject matter of the complaint. Um, um, and we say expands and extends the effect of that wording so as to reach the conclusion that the commissioner is entitled not to decide whether there has been an infringement or not. So can I ask you to look at paragraph 70 of the judgment, page 67 of the core bundle? Um, the, 
the judge says, if the commissioner has the power after minimal investigation to reject a complaint as spurious, of course, you know, that was my point that, that, that some complaints may be capable of resolution very quickly, then it must follow that it is a lawful exercise of power by the commissioner to decide after investigating a complaint to a limited extent that although it is not spurious, nonetheless, no further action should be taken. You say that's a non sequitur. Obvious non sequitur. And that if anything's to be gleaned from the power to bat off spurious complaints, uh, you would say the, the implication is that one takes care with ones that aren't. Indeed, and there's a, there's a, a, a similar point um, and a similar non secretary in paragraph 63 um, on page 65. But, but, but that is what one has to do to get to the, to the conclusion that the commissioner wants to reach. You have to engage in that sort of leap of logic to move from um, I, can, I can decide some complaints very easily to I don't have to decide any complaints. Um, now, before I leave Article 57.1f, I, I, I don't ignore the words, the opening words, handle complaints. And handle is not a, a word that we commonly, commonly find in English um, um, legislation, certainly where the duties of public bodies are concerned. It's usually handling stolen goods and that sort of thing. Um, um, but to, to, to handle um, complaints, there isn't any any useful case law on what that might mean. But we say, and I think I, I said it earlier, that it, it, it includes deciding the complaint, but it's broader than that. It's putting in place the administrative machinery to receive a complaint, to acknowledge it, to investigate it, and so forth. And what about outcome? Uh, that's an unusual word uh, that one doesn't find a lot. Is that also a word that includes but isn't limited to a decision? Well, we say we say it is it is a it, it is a decision. Um, um, I mean, that, that it is it is um, it is possible, and and I I believe this this does happen on some occasions with the commissioner that he gets a complaint, he gets in touch with the with the data controller and says, look, I think this is, this is going wrong. Can you, can you do something about this? And then um, there's, a, there's an amicable resolution with the, um, with the data controller and the complainant is happy and no need for a final decision. Um, but in the, in, the ordinary, in the ordinary case, we say an outcome is a decision um, and one sees um, can I can I ask you to look at so if we if we go to 110 and Article 78, um, it's the right to a remedy against a legally binding decision of the commissioner concerning them. Yeah. So that, that, that implicitly there will be some things that aren't legally binding. To Decisions, either decisions that aren't legally binding, or things that aren't decisions. And to f and to find out what a legally binding decision is, you need to look at a hundred recital one hundred and forty three on page thirty eight. One, one three eight. Uh, sorry, thirty eight. So, so yes, <laughs> yes, just trying to find it myself. Um, halfway down the paragraph, there's a line that begins with person. Yes. 
Such a decision. Such a decision. So, and, and that's a decision which produces legal effects concerning that person. Such a decision concerns, in particular, the exercise of investigative, corrective, and authorization powers by the supervisory authority, or the dismissal or rejection of complaints. So, pausing there, the the exercise of investigative, corrective, and authorization powers is likely to be the data controller who who wants to invoke a legal remedy against the commissioner those powers are invoked. But so far as complaints are concerned, the dismissal or rejection of complaints um, is a legally binding decision. And they, they, it goes on to tell us what um, the judicial remedy doesn't encompass. That's helpful. Um, yes. Opinions or advice. Yes. So um, if, one, if one goes back to Article 57, I, I won't right now, but there's a list of, of um, things that the supervisory authorities are asked to do, which include giving opinions, giving advice, um, doing things that aren't legally, legally binding. But so far as complaints are concerned, the dismissal or rejection of a complaint is a legally binding decision that must be subject to a remedy. So, yes, I so advice and so forth is not a possible outcome of a complaint. Then it goes on to say what happens when a complaint is being rejected or dismissed in the next paragraph. Yes. Yeah. Um, and although, although this recital still still appears in the UK GDPR Court of Records, the Court of Justice and so forth, it's, it's, it's no longer um, available. So um, my sixth heading then is Article 79, um, which is on page 111. Right to an effective judicial remedy against the data controller. Now, it is central to the Commissioner's argument that there exists, and there always exists, a right for the data subject to take action against the data controller to complain about exactly the same things as they might complain to the Commissioner about. And it's central to the Commissioner's argument because he says there is no need for him to decide whether an infringement of GDPR rights has occurred or not, because the complainant can take the data controller to court. So can I ask you to take up my learned friend's skeleton argument just to give you a few examples of this submission? Paragraph 18 of my learned friend's um, he says the DPA 2018, and, and just pausing there, the, the right to proceed against the data controller is section 167 of the Data Protection Act 2018. Um, I'm not sure if I showed you that. Um, he says the DPA provides a carefully calibrated regime that dovetails into the GDPR to provide a data subject dissatisfied with the response to a subject access request with both a fully effective private law remedy and an opportunity for regulatory complaint to the Commissioner. The latter supplements, he says, rather than duplicates the former. Um, he says the Commission is not required to turn over every stone. 
um, he says at the end of the page, that outcome does not preclude or even diminish the data subject's private law remedy. It is that remedy which provides the primary venue for a judicial determination of whether the data subject's DPA, GDPR rights have been infringed. Well. Um, that's paragraph 18, um, just a, and, a, and another example, paragraph 30. under the quotation from my skeleton, he says, the IC does not have to resolve the applicability of every exemption and every right conferred in order to reach a conclusion. The IC is not a proxy for the court on a private law claim. And in 31, he dispute, he, he, he doesn't accept that the commissioner um, is a dispute resolution mechanism. At the top of page 10 of his skeleton, he says that submission betrays a fundamental misunderstanding as to the IC's complaint function. Could we take a, a slightly different factual situation to the present one? Um, let's suppose at the time that a complaint was made to the Commissioner, um, there were up and running private proceedings already before a court about the identical matter. I just I appreciate that the proceedings in this case came after the complaint, so it's not. It's only for the light that it may or may not shine. Is is the obligation on the um, commissioner in those circumstances to reach a conclusion as to whether there has been a breach or not? Well, according to the BE case in the Court of Justice, uh, yes. Um, these are separate, independent remedies that can be exercised. No, but I mean, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to situate us in the, situate us in the real world. Um, let's suppose there's tremendous litigation going on about this um, in a sort of Facebook island level or, or, or maybe something nearer this case. But anyhow, tremendous litigation going on in court. Um, is the Commissioner obliged to investigate at the same time? Lord, I, I'm not going to to rule out the possibility of the Commissioner saying in a particular case that you're in court next week, um, I'm going to pause my investigation and I'm going to see what happens in the in the court case and then I'll give you a decision after that. That's, I'm, I'm not well, that's you're, 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 you're setting the hurdle in front of yourself quite low there. Um, I mean, let's suppose the reality of the situation is that um, <coughs> is that this tremendous litigation is going to lead to a result in two years, and and the commissioner just says, well, there's, there's, no, there's no point in my investigating this. Um, it's before the court, um, and um, therefore I'm going to NFA it. Um, it, it, it is your, your submission holds that that actually the commissioner is obliged to investigate it to the but as seems appropriate to the Commissioner to reach a, a decision as to whether there has or has not been a breach. That is the position in principle. Um, as I say, I don't rule out, and, it, and it, it may not be next week or next month, all, all a question of fact and degree. I don't, I don't rule out the Commissioner coordinating his, his investigation and his decision-making with ongoing proceedings. But in principle... The wording of the UK GDPR is that each of these remedies is without prejudice I, it seems to, me that the, the, to the other. The, the, I, I'm not asking you to shy away from this, but it seems to me that the logical conclusion is that even if the Commissioner was to say, <coughs> um, I'm going to wait until after the court before concluding my view on this complaint, nevertheless the Commissioner has to reach his or her own conclusion in relation to the complaint, which may or may not be the same as the conclusion of the court. Yes, yes, I, d I do say that. And they're proceedings between different parties, so neither would be binding on the other, I suppose. Well, um, what the BE case says, and, and, and I'm just going to go back. <laughs> Sorry, or even admissible, perhaps. One's taking a strict view on Hollington and Hewthorne. Um, 
this is the issue which was which was the key in the in the in the BE mm, case. Yeah. Um, two sets of proceedings, um, potentially conflicting outcomes um, in the two in the two sets of proceedings. Of course, one was a suing suing the commissioner having rejected the complaint. The other was suing the data controller, and the what the court says is is in principle um, it's a matter for each member state to lay down rules on uh, priority but if the courts have said there's been an infringement then it would reduce the it would create uncertainty and reduce the uh, level of protection for the data subject if that wasn't binding on the court in the other proceedings um, against the supervisory authority. Um, that that was that was the outcome of BE. Of BE. But the but the principle of BE that um, I, I think I, I, I'll, I'll go back to in a in a moment. The principle is that the words without prejudice to any any available administrative or non judicial remedy, including the right to lodge a complaint with a commissioner, is that these are separate independent remedies that can be exercised concurrently. Right. Now, the commissioner is just plain wrong to say that his role is diluted because the data subject can always go to court against the data controller. Well, there may be um, people who are not in your client's position um, for whom taking the matter to court might not be practical, for example. Well, well, yes, there are there are comparatively few um, county court, high court actions um, in this field, precisely because of the cost and the yeah. cost risk um, of doing so. Um, and even though somebody may feel very strongly about the treatment of their personal data, it's potentially life. No, so I, I, we come back to that. It's a point of principle. It's not a question of who the individual litigant is. But the, but it is it is significant and, and and helps to explain why it is important for the commissioner to be separate, independent choice of remedy, um, because he is he is an expert body who is free of charge. Yes. To the complainant, that that, that means a lot to to a lot of people. So can I just. Make sure that I've shown you all the bits of BE that I need to. It's it's tab twenty two at five eight nine, <coughs> um, and yes, it, it, it's. Paragraphs 42 that I have shown you, page 594, um, 42, 43. Um, yes, we looked at. Um, and then, and then the, the ratio, so 42, 43, and 44 is the principle that these are separate remedies in order to ensure a high degree of protection. And then the ratio. On the facts of that case were, is 54, 55, and 56, which set out what I sought to summarise a few moments ago um, was, the, was the court's decision. But the principle is separate remedies can be exercised independently, concurrently. Yes. And one really doesn't needs to go much further than the wording of Article 79 without prejudice to the right to lodge a complaint with the commissioner. Each data subject has the right to pursue the data control. Heading 7, then, is legislative history. Um, and the judges conclusion on legislative history 
is at paragraph 65, Roman 3, of his judgment at page 66 of the core bundle. Um, and he says that his purposive or common sense interpretation will, three, recognise that there is nothing to suggest that the legislature intended to change the previous law about complaints to the commissioner. And then he footnotes 12, the UK GDPR is a codifying, consolidating and updating measure under Lord Herschel's rule where there is doubt as to the meaning of words in such a measure, there is a presumption that the legislator did not intend to change the law and applying that presumption recourse may be had to the earlier legislation. Um, well, this was a finding made without the benefit of the party's submissions and uh, and the judge I'm afraid did go badly wrong in this in this respect. GDPR is not a codifying, consolidating and updating measure. Um, I don't believe that the commissioner supports the judge's reasoning um, in this in this regard. Um, it did not consolidate previous legislation. It implemented a wholly new piece of EU legislation, um, the GDPR, uh, which differed uh, considerably um, from the Data Protection Directive 9546. There was a post-hearing note about this. There's a post-hearing note which you have at the end of the core, uh, sorry, I think at the end of the supplementary yes. bundle. But, but what the note does, let me put Mr. B Mr. Bednam and I had no idea that this was going to prove so central to the judge's reasoning. Otherwise, we, we might have argued about it, or, or we sorry, we we might have put submissions in the note. He asked us for a note on the previous legislation, and we gave him just that, without making submissions as to what conclusion he ought to draw from the previous legislation. So that's at page 101 onwards of the supplementary. Yes. Article. Um, so, I've given you the extract from Benyon that he cites. Um, could, you, could you just, in a nutshell, without us diving into the detail of it, just what, uh, what, what was the gist of your note um, in terms of uh, what, what the past it consisted of and what the GDPR then wrought? Well, the, the gist of the note was that under the two previous domestic regimes, there had been a power, and in some respects a duty, on the commissioner or his predecessor to decide, uh, broadly speaking, complaints. But it was put in in a very different way, um, particularly in the Data Protection Act 1998, which was the direct predecessor of the, of the, um, of the UK GDPR. Um, and, and again, without going into very much detail, can I just show you the relevant provision from the Data Protection Act? Um, it is um, um, page page um, one hundred and forty two of the authorities bundle in tab five. <coughs> rather than a, a complaint, um, the... Section 42, is it? Section 42. Thank you. A request may be made to the commissioner for an assessment as to whether it is likely or unlikely 
that data processing has been or is being carried out in compliance with the provisions of the Act. Um, the Commissioner shall make an assessment in such manner as appears to him to be appropriate. And subsection 3, in determining in what manner it is appropriate to make an assessment, he will have regard to, or may have regard to, the extent to which the request appears to him to raise a matter of substance, any undue delay in making the request, and whether or not the person making the request is entitled to make an application under Section 7, that's the, that's the um, right against the data controller in respect of the personal data in question. Now, what I apprehend, and there isn't any, any, any evidence from the Commissioner to this effect, but what I apprehend is that the Commissioner has continued his practice under the 1998 Act by deciding whether breach was likely or unlikely, um, and he's taken into account, uh, and he said in, in his defence in these proceedings, the existence of the right um, to claim against the data controller, and he takes into account the extent to which the request appears to him to raise a matter of substance. So his practice has not changed, it appears, but the legislation has changed very significantly, and the UK GDPR implementing the EU GDPR doesn't contain any of these um, qualifications or limitations on the on the commissioner's obligations. And um, one can one can look at the at the directive which the nineteen ninety eight Act was implementing. You've got it in the in the bundle of authorities and that's that's quite a bit more definitive about the duty to decide claims. Um, but really this is a this is a rabbit hole which um, it was, with all due respect to the judge, unnecessary to go down and has led him into error. Could we just return to the judgment and to remind ourselves precisely how he considered the pre GDPR yes, so materials? Yes, so you find that from paragraph. Well, no, no, in fact, it starts at paragraph 9. Um, and goes 51, page 51. All the way through to... Yes, sorry, 51, and goes all the way through to <coughs> paragraph 38 at page 57. Um, he then looks at the UK GDPR um, and... In paragraph, I'm sorry, paragraph forty-five. Right, before, before we look at this, can I just situate it in within the argument that you've been having? Um, the judge was tasked with, with with construing the current legislation. Um, did this? Um, quite lengthy part of the part of the judgment in relation to previous arrangements um, largely spring from the post hearing note. Yes, yes, there were no submissions made at the hearing um, about about the, the the past. The past. No, the, and the, no ju the judge has um, included a long part of the judgment. Um, on, on things that were enforced before the GDPR. Yes, right. sir. And that, and that was not because he was asked by anybody particularly to do it, but um, because he'd been given the information post hearing. Yes, he'd, he'd, he'd asked yes. for the note, he'd been given the information, and yes, I think we, perhaps last week's Mr. Bednam here, we, did, we didn't appreciate how, how much this. Issue was figuring in his in his thoughts. Right, and he concluded that this was a very light touch regime, um, and that because of because this was a consolidating piece of legislation, 
Um, one would suppose that nothing had changed. Yes, he said the pre previous regime was was light touch in, in, in broad I'm summary. looking at paragraph 37. Nothing had changed uh, and <coughs> because of the principle of consolidating legislation, you must assume that it was. So that's how the argument goes? Yes. Thank you. But it's, it's not consolidating legislation yeah. and there are significant differences with the Data Protection Act 1998 and insofar as they go anywhere, we say they support us because the, the previous limitations um, on the commissioner's uh, uh, complaint determining right, so you, powers. You say that this excursion um, helped the judge to mislead himself in his construction of the current regime. Um, heading, heading eight um, is resources, um, which we deal with in paragraph 52 of our skeleton argument. Um, there will, no doubt, and the judge recognised this, be resourcing implications if the decision of this court is that the commissioner is required to determine complaints in substance whether there have been infringements of the GDPR. Um, but that is because, to date, the resources sought, we apprehend, and provided to the Commissioner have been premised on an incorrect legal view as to, the, uh, as to him having complete discretion as to which, if any, investigations of complaints are pursued to a decision on infringement. Um, there is, as I've already pointed out, a degree of exaggeration in the Commissioner's position. He's not going to be required to turn over every stone, look at every possible infringement, etc. Uh, but he is undoubtedly going to have to, to take more time, uh, recruit more people um, to reach decisions in more cases. We don't know how many more cases because we don't. But the judge was with you on this, on this particular point. Um, I mean, it, it, uh, paragraph seven. Paragraph seven. Yeah. Um, um, and these calculations that are carried out in the um, footnote, is that the judge's calculation or was yeah. that the evidence? That's the judge's calculation. No, no, no evidence on this at all. The only. The only evidence uh, put before the court by the commissioner you have in the core bundle at tab 11 and is a short witness statement um, that deals with this particular complaint only and not, and not with any broader picture. <coughs> statement is, did you say tab 7? I said tab, is tab, 11, tab 11. At least I hope I said tab 11 at page tab 11, 144. I beg your 144. Can we just find the paragraph that deals with resources? Is there one? Um, no, there isn't. Um, I mean, it's the The statement is directed to this particular complaint, and the only really broader comments are at paragraph 12 and 13, where there's a statement of the Commissioner's interpretation of the legislation. And then paragraph 15, as a regulator, we have to be selected. We're not sure where the have to be selective comes from. Um, and it's paragraph six, isn't it, that, that, uh, of the judgment, which? Yes. 
and presumes it comes from some source of the commissioners. Yes. Um, so I, I recall my instructing this has reminded me that Mr. Bedenham cited some numbers from a from a report from an annual report published by the yeah. commissioner, which is, I believe, where the where the figures in All right. the second sentence, paragraph six, comes from. Thank you. Um, numbers of staff and so forth. But as I as I mentioned earlier, we don't know how many complaints he does take to a conclusion, take to a, a conclusion on infringement. Um, well, Lord, that really c concludes my submissions on ground one. We say all of those factors go to support. And so that's really knitting in all the various um, smaller grounds into one comprehensive submission on that. Very good. Yes, yes I, I, I haven't reiterated every point made in my skeleton, but yep. well, we have to sort of confess it. <coughs> Thank you. Will that take us to ground two? Yes. So ground two, and I need to go to my skeleton argument, please, at um, starts at paragraph 54. Right, so if you succeed on ground one, you don't need ground two. That's right. So if you take the view that the commissioner was not required to determine the appellant's complaint, uh, to, to determine whether or not there was an infringement of the appellant's GDPR rights, um, because, sorry, if you, des if you decide that the commissioner is not obliged to decide all complaints yes. uh, in terms of whether there was an infringement or not, then ground two makes the argument that he was required to decide this complaint. The argument is effectively that it, um, he could not rationally choose not to do so. Um, yes with the qualification that that um, rationality is put not in the so unreasonable that no reasonable person could have done it but in the but in the in the sense of of errors of logical reasoning um, uh, I mean I don't I don't put it in terms of, of rationality at all but I, but it's but we, but we do we do complain of errors in the in the commissioner's reasoning I mean, just any old error is not is not is not, is not the point. Um, it, it, it has to be an error of the kind that means that the decision is fundamentally flawed, does it not? However, one treats it. In, yes. Yes. In the level of review of rationality. Yes. Yes. There, there must be an error of reasoning, an error of of logic. The reasoning does not stack up. To use the old. Sadly, um, I, I haven't given you an authority um, on this. Uh, but I'll no, right. the, the, the point we get is that, however one expresses it, the, the, the commissioner was, although not compelled to investigate every complaint, compelled to investigate yours. Yes. So, um, we come back to the reasoning in the in the witness statement, and we've um, summarised the reasoning at paragraph 54 of our skeleton, um, and it's a and the commissioner's reasoning is a is a combination of the witness statement and his and his uh, amended grounds of defence, um, and the reasons that we pick out. Are we looking, it's helpful here, is it, to look at 54 of your, of your skeleton? 54 of our skeleton, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Subparagraph 1, um, second sentence, he is prioritised by deciding to concentrate his efforts on dealing with matters we think 
give us the best opportunity to make a significant difference to an organization's information rights practices. Um, didn't prioritize this complaint. And number three, the commissioner argued that he was justified in not pursuing this complaint to a determination on infringement because he said it appeared to the commissioner from the correspondence provided by the appellant that Wise had lightly complied with its data protection obligations and there was no suggestion of a blanket approach by Wise and the appellant had another route by which to seek to hold Wise to account, uh, i.e. In the, in the High Court. Um, and that's a, a quotation from, from the amended grounds of defence, which in turn summarises the Commissioner's <coughs> decisions uh, in, the, in the appellant's case. Um, now, before I say why we submit the reasoning was uh, uh, affected by a, a, a sufficiently serious error, um, is that the, is just to say this, the, the approach adopted by the court is and must be to exercise full jurisdiction on questions of fact and law. See the, see the recital to the uh, GDPR C, C to BE case. So we're not here engaged with a light touch judicial review, um, classic regulatory discretion type of case. We're concerned with full jurisdiction on issues of fact and law. Now, we submit, and it's paragraph 55.1, the complaint did raise issues of importance and of potentially wide ranging effect concerned with the fundamental data subject right uh, concerning a data controller which dealt with large numbers of members of the public. But secondly, and really most <coughs> importantly, the Commissioner, we say, could not properly make a determination as to whether it was likely that WISE had complied with its data protection obligations without at least making inquiries of WISE as to what personal data had been withheld and on what grounds. Absolutely fundamental to whether WISE had complied or not to understand whether they had withheld any data at all, or what they had withheld and why they had withheld it. The Commissioner didn't, didn't know that because it wasn't apparent from the correspondence between Wise and my client, which was all that the Commissioner had with the complaint. And he took no steps whatsoever to investigate by asking Wise when it would have been a simple matter to do so. So how the Commissioner could possibly say that it was likely that WISE had complied with its obligations without knowing these fundamental matters. We simply don't, simply don't understand. And in, in terms of investigating to the extent appropriate, he didn't even get past first base. He didn't equip himself with the fundamentals, what data was withheld and why. Now, the judge um, quoted, as I showed you at the start of my submission, some guidance from the commissioner at page, uh, paragraph 4, page 49 of the core bundle. Um, under what the ICO can do to help me. Um, third bullet point, we will usually ask the organization to do everything they can to explain how they have handled or processed your personal data as the law expects. And then on the following page, 
what happens when I submit my complaint to the ICO at the top of the page. Um, the case officer will weigh up the facts of what's happened fairly and impartially, ask the organisation and you for further information if they think they need it. Well, they obviously needed it in this case. Obviously. And it's never been explained to us how they, how the commissioner was able to reach the conclusion that WISE had lightly complied with its obligations without taking the first and most basic step to understand what WISE had actually done. <coughs> and frankly, if, if this is what the commissioner thinks is the extent to which investigation is appropriate, and this is replicated across a wider range of complaints, and something has gone very badly wrong with the full enforcement of the GDPR, which the Commissioner is supposed to ensure. Well, <clears throat> if, um, if, if the Commission does have a, a a power to decide <coughs> rationally whether to devote resources to a particular complaint. <coughs> there may be cases, surely, at one end of the scale where you've got a, an enormously respectable, large-scale, well-resourced institution that appears to have taken a view about its legal duties. Uh, and the Commissioner has no reason to doubt on the face of it that the view is a legitimate one, because it involves an evaluative assessment um, of what's happened in the context of a statutory regime. I'm, I'm being a little bit delicate here, because I don't want to imply there's anything wrong here, but you know what I'm talking no, about. No, I, I, I do. <coughs> I'm Lord, I'm Lord, if, if the Commissioner had, had got to the next stage, where he'd actually asked Wise what they'd done, then I could fully understand, and I would have some sympathy with, with, with what my Lord has said to me, that where, where the Commissioner understands what data was withheld and why, and it's dealing with a respectable organisation that has clearly put some thought into this, then, then there may not be much more that needs to be done to investigate to the extent appropriate, I, I, of course. But, but to simply say, without knowing, you know, these, these seem like good chaps to me, I mean, I just can't, I just can't be an appropriate. But as a supplemental. I mean, if one was to go to the other end of the scale, wherever one might put the institution, in this case, um, and find that there'd been egregious breaches um, that appeared on the face of the information provided with the complaint, um, which, which were you know, obviously harmful to very large numbers of people and um, cried out for um, <coughs> investigation. I mean, isn't, isn't the point that the, that the Commissioner is in a position to decide where his resources have to go? And if, if the conclusion is that everybody can't fit in the boat, um, then there have to be some prioritising. Well, um, my Lord, I, I make the point about resources that the judge made, and, and, and I, I dealt with it under underground one, but I wouldn't accept that even under underground two that it's legitimate for the commissioner to say we don't have enough money to look into your complaint. Because the, 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 the GDPR is perfectly clear that, that the resources must be provided to do what's necessary to investigate to the extent appropriate. Um, so, so no, I, I, I I don't accept that. that, that but your submission is that resources are equally um, irrelevant under Ground Two as they were under Ground One. Yes. Okay. So can you remind me where the where the obligation is to provide the resources? Yes. Um, so, so as the judge noted in paragraph seven. It's in Cital 120 of the GDPR. <coughs> uh, which you have at 33. Of the, of the 
authorities want to do. Thank you. But just as it, just as it, it's, it was wrong for the commissioner to say, um, we don't need to ask why's what it has withheld and why because they, uh, I put it um, um, colloquially, they seem like good chaps to us. Um, um, equally, in the example that my lord gives, if the commissioner was dealing with an organisation which had been guilty in the past of wholesale breaches of data rights, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be right for the commissioner to reach the opposite decision. Yes, we, we you know we these these people have form. Um, he couldn't say that um, without having at least asked asked the uh, the data controller for an explanation as to what it had done and why. Um, so <coughs> that is the the um, um, significant error, we say, of reasoning that the Commissioner made here. Um, simply no basis for finding that it was likely that Wise had complied without having equipped himself with the basic information necessary to that decision. And similarly, and this is subparagraph three of the uh, skeleton um, paragraph 55 is whether or not Wise had adopted a blanket approach, and the, the Commissioner's decision said, well, it looks like they haven't adopted a blanket approach. Uh, they, they took an individual decision. But the Commissioner had no idea whether Wise adopted a blanket approach or not. Um, simply hadn't, hadn't asked them. And had he asked Wise, had he made the basic inquiries, then it might have been revealed that this was an opportunity to make a significant difference to WISE's information law practices. You can't just close your eyes and not ask the questions and say, well, this case isn't important enough, um, um, and, we're, and we're not going to find out whether it's important enough by asking the questions. And finally, in its subparagraph 5 of paragraph 55, the Commissioner relied on the appellant's right to to take wise to the civil courts. I quoted the summary grounds of uh, the, the grounds of defence, and, and again, where perhaps the commissioner is back in the in the world of the DPA 1998, uh, where that was a specific factor that he could have regard to in in in, in limiting the extent of his assessment, but simply not the case anymore. He is a separate, independent, concurrent remedy, um, and the civil action is neither here nor there. The civil action, which hadn't, by that stage, been commenced. Yes. So that's ground two. Thank you. Um, the respondent's notice point. I'll try and finish before the short adjournment. Be helpful. So Thank to you. give you a. a, a an overview of what we say on the respondents' notice points. The first point is academic. Well, conveniently, we're, we're, we're picking you up at paragraph 58, aren't we? Yes, 58 of the skeleton. Um, judge held, claim academic, but good reason in the public interest to hear it, nevertheless. Um, we don't agree that the claim was academic, or is academic, um, and we relied on two, two factors. Firstly, that the, the appellant had never obtained any, any finding that Wise had acted in breach of his, of his data rights. So, that, so as you'll recall, the, the basis for the submission of the claim as academic was that Wise had in order to settle the High Court proceedings, provided the data which it had previously withheld without admission of liability. Mm. So no finding, um, either from the court or from the commissioner, uh, that there had been a breach of the appellant's data rights. Um, and secondly, 
there were not only other proceedings on foot against the Commissioner in the Administrative Court raising the same issues, but actually closely related proceedings. Um, so the judge recounts that the that Wise had reported the appellant to the National Crime Agency, um, and the appellant had sought his data from the National Crime Agency, refused, complained to the Commissioner, refused, and there were judicial review proceedings on foot, uh, raising the same issue of whether the Commissioner was required to decide um, the appellant's complaint or not. So by no means, we say, an, an academic claim. But even, even if it was, um, we say that the judge was right to to decide that there was a good reason in the public interest uh, to hear the claim. But in doing so, he was exercising, see paragraph 60 of our skeleton argument, a case management discretion. And um, adopting the, the well-established approach and the approach adopted by this court and by my Lord and My Lady in the Appell M&P and Devon County Council case, it is incumbent upon the Commissioner to identify some error of principle um, in, the, in the judge's um, reasoning or to, or to establish that he's taken a decision out with the generous margin of discretion available to him. Um, but if you, if you look at paragraph 113 of the judgment on page 74 of the core bundle the judge directed himself to the relevant test in the Salem case and having decided between 114 and 121 that the claim was academic, he then says at 122 that it's in the public interest for the claim to be heard essentially because the, the core question had not been directly considered in domestic or European case law previously, which is a point that my Lord put to me earlier. And 123, the declaration if granted would alter a very long-standing understanding of the role and functions of the Commissioner when dealing with complaints. So there was a, there was and is a, an important point of principle which has the potential to affect many thousands of complaints each year. And there was no error of principle in the judge's approach to find that that was a sufficient reason to hear the claim. Um, alternative remedy, then, um, and I'm at paragraph 61 of my skeleton. Um, the Commissioner says that there were two alternative remedies which uh, should have been or indeed were invoked by the appellant. The, the claim against the data controller um, which I deal with at 66 and 67 of the skeleton um, and in essence what I say about that is that's a separate right. Um, and if the commissioner was correct that the claim against the data controller is a suitable alternative remedy for judicial review purposes, then judicial review of the commissioner would never be available. A civil claim against a third party, we'd say, is, is not a, an alternative remedy for the purposes of a claim against the public body in any event, but this would, this would completely remove judicial review as a possible remedy and would therefore be inconsistent with the express provisions of the GDPR.
Um, the Commissioner, from the outset, argued that the claim against Wise, a claim against Wise, was a suitable alternative remedy. Um, once permission was granted, he also argued that there was an alternative statutory remedy against the Commissioner in Section 166 of the Data Protection Act. Um, and if you look at page 137 of the core bundle, please. <coughs> um, and this is the Commissioner's um, detailed grounds of defence after permission and what he did was he he reproduced the summary grounds with underlining to show what was added in the detailed yes. grounds and he has added in the detailed grounds this alternative remedy argument uh, 166 of the um, um, of the DPA uh, and there's more argumentation on page 139 onwards but the point about this is having having failed to rely upon this alternative remedy at the permission stage, where alternative remedy comes in at the substantive stage is, is, on, is on remedial discretion. It's not a, a reason not to hear the case at all. It's a, it's a reason why the court might exercise its discretion as to remedy, um, having, having heard the case and decided it. Um, and I've given you an authority uh, in the bundle um, um, at tab 18 of Jeremy Johnson KC as he then was in the B and Redbridge case explaining in paragraph 25 how how alternative remedy fits in at the at the substantive stage and saying under, understandably that, that once once the court has heard the case and is going to reach a decision, it will only exceptionally be that an alternative remedy is a, is a reason for denying relief. Um, um, but the remedy in section 166 of the Data Protection Act, um, which is at page 1, 167 of the authorities bundle um, we can by all means go there but I mean, you're seeking to uphold the judge on, on this but he accepted your arguments in full didn't he? He did. So I mean in, really in this regard I'm just wondering we've got 100, paragraph 126 of the judgment page 76 in which between there and um, paragraph 134, the judge fully accepts your arguments. I mean, do, do we need, at the moment, for the purpose of your presentation at this stage, to <coughs> to know more? My Lord, no, and I can see that the, the importance of finishing before lunch... Um, uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't mean, I mean, if we need to hear you no, in, I, I in response, of course, you'll have the opportunity to go more fully into it in order to do that, but it, essentially, if it's just um, reminding us what the judge, what you argued, and what the judge agreed with, uh, we've got that conveniently to hand. Yes, um, indeed. I yes, I'm 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 content to deal with it in reply. Only for this at this point. Okay. Um, and <coughs> those are my. Anything else? No. No. Well, thank you for, for, for your economy. You've not lost nothing by it. It's been very helpful. I think you've um, covered um, the ground very effectively. Um, so shall we hear from, from you, Mr. Copley, two o'clock? Thank you. Thank you.